My name is Niels um, and I'm doing a PhD in automotive security for the last four years. Um, and today I will talk a little bit about automotive security in general to give some overview about the topic. Um, I will go into existing tools um, at the time when we started to, um, to hack cars basically then I introduce Scapy and the automotive additions we made to it. Um, so Scapy is the tool of choice um, that we uh, extended with various automotive um, and penetration testing features. Uh, I show some use cases of our tools um, and explain them. Um, and later, yeah, uh, I have a slide for the availability of our tools and then I will, yeah, put some, some points from my side um, regarding open source and automotive security, which can be later maybe um, uh, yeah, be used for discussion of the entire um, topic. So uh, about me, I started as an electro uh, electronics technician, then I become later a state certified electrical engineer in Germany. Um, and then after that, I started to study computer science. So I worked uh, around seven years in the electronics industry um, before I started with uh, my bachelor studies. Um, and then I finally did a master program in applied science um, with the topic of automotive security. Security At this time, I was already um, going into this field um, and I had the chance then to continue my studies in a PhD program where I'm focusing at the moment um, again on automotive security. So uh, to give an overview about car hacking and the research, what's going on, like the most famous basically publications and, and hacks, I have um, some, um, yeah, some citations here, which I just want to mention uh, to get an overview of what happened in the past. Um, so in 2010 and 11, um, Kosher et al. and Checkaway did very um, comprehensive analysis of cars uh, and published um, this in the USENIX and in IEEE. Uh, later then in 2013, Miller and Wallace started. Um, they did in summary um, four individual publications um, which were also based on each other kind of um, and the, the third one was their famous remote hack of a Jeep which probably everyone knows, um, which is a little bit interested in this field. Um, we also had in 2015 a hack from a German hacker, Dieter Spar, who was able to open um, Beamers uh, remotely through some vulnerabilities. Uh, then there was also another publication from Miller and Wallersack where they first showed that they can um, uh, change the or they can inject um, CAN messages to turn the steering wheel of a car while driving. Um, later then we had also Greg Smith publishing a car hacker's handbook. So there was another like, um, a group starting with, with research and with, with car hacking. Um, and then um, we had Tencent coming up. Um, they were showing uh, Tesla hacks in 2017. Um, and then in 2019, we had the first time that the uh, Zero Day Initiative and the Power to Own competition um, had a, a car as price or as a target for hacking. So they used the Tesla Model 3 here um, to get hacked. Um, another publication came from a Dutch company, Computest. They hacked into Audi and Volkswagen cars. And then again, Tencent in 2018, <clears throat> where they hacked a bunch of beamers um, also remotely. So just a little bit as an overview, what was going on. So cars getting hacked remotely now and need to be secured in a certain way. Um, to get an overview about the internal structure of the cars, um, here's a um, slide with three different topologies. Um, these are simplified topologies. I, don't have um, LINF, LexRay, and MOST communication technology here on that slides, um, but this will show a little bit um, what we have in, in cars so far. Uh, in, in older cars or very, very cheap cars, we have 
um, single line bus networks where we have, for example, one or two um, CAN networks, as we see on top of the slide here. Um, so this is a very simple bus network. Um, every ECU can talk to any other ECU, um, and we only see it in lowest priced cars nowadays. Um, in higher priced cars or middle priced cars um, from, yeah, let's say a couple of years old cars already, we have gateway ECUs um, here, uh, which separate certain communication domains. Um, so we have a communication domain here with a CAN bus network, for example, it can also be a flexway network here for one specific kind of ECUs. So here in this domain, we, for example, only have infotainment ECUs. And in another domain here on that side, for example, we have all the ECUs related to um, driving stability or engine control, powertrain, for example. Um, and this is a huge security feature by itself um, because the ECUs with remote interfaces, for example, on this side, cannot directly communicate with the ECUs on that side. So if one ECU gets compromised on the left side, uh, it requires another vulnerability here um, to overcome the gateway network separation, basically. Um, so this is what we have in um, in most modern cars at the moment, I would say. Um, and the next thing which is showing up on very expensive or very, very new cars is automotive Ethernet as a backbone. I hope you can see that. So the green lines here should um, stay for automotive Ethernet. Um, and then we have a gateway ECU here in the center, which has a couple of um, Ethernet connections, acts as a router um, or a switch. Um, and additionally, we have domain controllers um, uh, to be a gateway for each individual domain um, to connect to the Ethernet network. Um, this is very handy for automotive OEMs since this allows them to change the message routing um, of messages on the fly. So by reconfiguring the um, domain controllers and the gateway, they can, for example, um, subscribe to new data identifiers from one network to another. So if they want to realize features on demand, for example, they can change the network configuration of the Ethernet network and then new messages going from here to there. But so this is like the, the latest um, uh, innovation that we have at the moment, uh, which is out in the market already. Good. Um, to give an overview about the protocols, I have the application or the, the protocol stack here for automotive protocols on the left side, CAN based a network stack and on the right side, uh, IEEE based network stack. Um, here I'm focusing on diagnostic protocols since this is um, yeah, what I'm doing in my studies the most. Uh, on top, we have uh, the diagnostic protocol UDS OBD and XCP here. And underneath um, for the routing on CAN based network or for the transport, um, we need another protocol which is called ISOTP in this case. Um, and this is on top of CAN. So CAN has only this eight bytes data frames, ISOTP can send, um, uh, I think, up to gigabytes, but let's say in the um, first standard, it was four kilobyte, um, uh, which is, let's say, the, the, the most the most common used case. So they can communicate four kilobytes of data now um, over multiple CAN frames. Um, we are fragmented into uh, a lot of CAN frames, basically. Uh, GM Lam is a little bit of exception here since Per definition, the standard defines both um, transport and application layer, but uh, it's identical to ISOTP. So the TMLAN standard uh, can also be seen as um, application layer protocol, and it works exactly um, as UDS on top of ISOTP. Um, but I want to be clear here with the standard. Um, on the other side, when we think about IEEE-based um, communication, Ethernet-based communication, no matter if it's automotive Ethernet now or normal Ethernet, um, on top we have the transport protocol. Um, the left is diagnostic over IP, which is uh, the, the newest standard. Um, on the right side, it's a proprietary protocol used only by BMW, which is kind of um, uh, the earlier innovation um, and 
diagnostic over IP was basically standardized afterwards and was somehow um, got some ideas from that. It's called HSFZ, which is a German word called high speed Fahrzeugzugang. Um, but and again, on top of these transport protocols, we have UDS, OBD, and XCP again. Uh, and, but now they are on the right side encapsulated into diagnostic over IP frames, and this one get encapsulated into TCP frames or UDP frames, and then sent over the IP network. And here it's the other way around. We have one packet which gets split into CAN packets and then sent on the CAN network. Good. Um, some other protocols here just to be complete. Um, CAN is also is mainly used for exchanging process data. Um, this process data is defined in DVC files or AutoSAR XML files usually. Some IP is an, another Ethernet based protocol um, uh, on top of IP. Um, and this allows to basically for the same purposes can to transfer signal data um, over Ethernet. Uh, then we have also TSN, TSN AVB for real time audio visual broadcasting. Um, and some other protocols, of course, since we do Ethernet now in cars, we have VLAN, IPv4, IPv6, ICMP, DHCP, UDP, and TCP. Okay, um, that's what's going on in car protocols and car networks. Um, if we want to pen test IEEE um, Ethernet networks, that's easy. We have NMAP, we have Wireshark, we have a bunch of other um, well-known open source tools for Ethernet or internet protocol hacking, um, and we can directly start. Also a side note here, a Wireshark has great support for CAN. You can use socket CAN and directly analyze the CAN frames. Um, CAN Matrix is an open source project, uh, which I want to mention here since it allows uh, to allow us to directly create Wireshark D sectors from DVC or AR XML files. So if you get these files in your hands, you can directly use Wireshark with them. Um, but on CAN, um, we started with, with car hacking and had some problems. We, we saw a lot of tools there, like everyone was um, presenting a new car hacking tool, kind of. Um, and we were a little bit um, sad because um, these tools were kind of limited. Um, so some tools were pretty limited to one specific OEM, for example. Other projects were not maintained at all. Um, again, other projects had no active community. Um, some were only uh, written for one operating system and not uh, platform independent. And again, other protocols or projects, uh, sorry, projects um, were only made for one specific hardware interface. So we needed to buy like this specific hardware interface to work with it. Um, some other tools just crashed because they were not maintained anymore. Um, and again, other tools were also not really maintainable. There were no unit tests. There was no continuous integration. So it was mm, hard to use them for, let's say, um, long-term stuff. Um, also, some others were just not extendable through very bad software architecture. We had uh, some tools had like a couple of thousand um, files and huge functions, not understandable at all. But um, yeah, another point I want to underline this um, more with a graph here. Uh, these are the Git um, commits per year um, for a couple of open source tools here. And this is quite interesting. So this gives a very good overview about if a open source project is somehow um, well maintained or if it was more or less a one day fly and is now almost dead and did not get any commits anymore. Um, here we see two projects. Um, the green is Metasploit, which is very famous for um, network hacking. And we also have Scappy here. These both protocols are now out there for 15, 16 years, which is already a long time for an open source tool, in my opinion. Um, Another interesting line is Busmaster. This is a tool invented by um, a company um, from Bosch, um, as far as I know. Um, they started with a couple of hundred commits a year, but then rapidly stopped the development entirely. Also other tools here were just yeah, one year, some work, um, and then they stopped working on it. Um, so basically um, this underlines 
our decision. So we wanted to have a tool uh, which was out there for quite a while and which is maintained. And we choose Scappy um, because we already saw that there were a lot of tutorials and documentations for beginners. Uh, it has an active community with great maintainers, which do an amazing job. We um, also had the fact that Scappy was originating from Ethernet and IP-based penetration testing. And this is exactly the direction where the automotive industry goes. So automotive industry develops into that field. So we thought, okay, we just add CAN here, uh, and then we have one tool um, for all the networks. Also, Scappy works on Linux, Windows, OS X, Solaris, and B some BSDs. Um, and it has unit tests and continuous integration for everything, which is amazing. Uh, so now here are some slides about my contributions. I just want to mention here some highlights. Um, this is a long list, but I will not go through it. Through this one, I just leave this list here for later if someone wants to um, get some ideas. Um, on the CAN layer, we implemented or we, we extended the CAN implementation and implemented two kind of sockets, native and CAN um, and Python CAN sockets. Uh, this allows us to have a transparent way to talk to um, CAN sockets in general. Uh, Python CAN is another open source project which supports up to 13 different uh, CAN bus interfaces and runs on Windows um, OS X. So this allows us to have one tool um, for every platform and for every CAN interface, basically, which is out there. Um, native CAN sockets are more performant if you are on Linux. Um, then we implement a couple of utilities, signal fields, if you want to analyze DBC data, we add a CAN dump reader, which is a small utility to get packets out of CAN dumps. Um, on ISOTP, we implemented ISOTP packets, um, some ISOTP headers, if you want to analyze CAN files for ISOTP um, control flow. Uh, an ISOTP message builder, which is quite handy. It allows you to defragment a bunch of CAN messages into one ISOTP message on the fly. Um, an ICTP soft and native socket, which is similar to what we did with what we did on Python CAN and native CAN sockets. So this um, ICTP sockets allow to send ICTP communication, and the soft socket here is um, doing everything in Python user land, like the entire network handling. This allows us again um, to have this ICTP soft socket on every platform. ICTP native sockets are using a Linux kernel module, um, which got into the kernel in 5.10. So this is pretty new, and I'm happy that this kernel module finally went into the kernel. Um, but this allows us to have an extremely performant ISOTP socket um, for Linux devices. We implemented ISOTP scan as a scanner utility. Um, also, HSFZ transportation layer here, this BMW proprietary protocol with packets and sockets, um, diagnostic over IP, basically the same, transparent sockets here, packet descriptions to have these sectors, um, and then diagnostic protocols finally in the application layer. We have UDS here, UDS scanner, GMLAN, GMLAN utilities, and GMLAN scanner to do all bunch of stuff. The same for OBD, <clears throat> OBD protocol itself, and OBD scanner configuration protocols like CCP and XCP, which are usually only used during development of ECUs, but sometimes you even see it on a release or on a ECU that you buy from eBay. Um, also an XCP scanner here, and then some IP and another, some other utilities here, ECU utilities and ECU answering machine utilities, which allow us to uh, instantaneously uh, virtualize ECUs based on some network traffic we captured. But I will show an example later. Um, okay, what do we do with that stuff? Um, this is an example of a test setup we have. Um, here on the left side, we see the entire um, rack uh, where we have a couple of um, Raspberry Pis here. On the left side, you see a Raspberry Pi with a CAN shield. Um, and you see a couple, uh, two ECUs here connected over CAN. 
And in total, I have here uh, 15 different ECUs, which I can automatically test. So I can run hardware in the loop tests of my open source software against um, these ECUs. It's also very useful to see if something changed while I was developing that software. Um, and yeah, here's some examples. We can do automated scans now with only a few lines of code. Um, so basically here, we create a socket object um, and we give this socket to the scanner and that's it. Finally, we get some results and this tells us uh, the all supported features of an ECU on a diagnostic protocol, for example. The same is also existing for UDS here. Um, GMLAN is just one example. I did a little bit more research on that. Um, it's very interesting that every ECU has its independent um, system state machine. So it has a uh, system state machine, um, which is defined by certain diagnostic jobs. For example, so here's a list of state changing diagnostic jobs. We have, for example, diagnostic session control, ECU reset, security access, communication control, routine control, and test present on the UDS side. Um, These jobs uh, are interesting because they change the communication behavior of an ECU. Um, for example, a diagnostic session control can allow you to enter the bootloader of an ECU, which entirely changes the running software and completely changes the attack surface from a security point of view. Um, so with our scanner, we implemented basically two objects here, like an enumerator and a scanner object. The enumerator is a lower um, object, um, which basically enumerates through all the possible features of one service of a diagnostic protocol. Um, the scanner, on the other hand, has a list of enumerators and executes every enumerator. But also the scanner takes care about having an ECU always in a desired state. So what I mean with state uh, can be seen from the next slide. Here are two different system state machines which were automatically reverse engineered from our scanner. Um, so, for example, we always start in a default state here, where we enter with a reset, which is done through a power cycle, and then by sending out certain diagnostic commands, we get into new states. Here, for example, we enter security access and get into a diagnostic state with security access. Um, we also can change the diagnostic session to go into a programming session, for example, um, and every of these states um, has a different set of functions supported and therefore also a different attack surface. Um, also very interesting, uh, some of these states even have a different communication behavior, which proves um, that this state's actually executing a different firmware. So, for example, here on my ECU E7, um, which I marked here with this label, uh, I had in the default session a response time after an UDS request from around 20 milliseconds. Um, and they did this for 1,900 samples. So this is just a simple average here. And in one specific state, which I um, later verified by manual reverse engineering, that this was the bootloader, um, I had a response time from 8.18 milliseconds. So this is a dramatical change in the communication behavior, and it's just measured by a user land Python application. So I did not even need to do any um, hardware low-level timing measurements. Um, the socket interface from Linux was completely fine here to already show uh, this dramatic change. Here, for example, E10, um, factor of 10, different in communication. But this is also very explainable if you think about that the bootloader is a very limited set of software and um, the execution is much faster probably because there is just less function functionality, less threats in the background. Um, this is another example what we can do with such open source software. This is a proof of concept exploit for one ECU. Um, but the main advantage here is, uh, in my opinion, that we now can write down such proof of concept exploits in a high level language like Python. Um, we define a couple of sockets, but we only need to 
provide these sockets as objects. So if you imagine that you have a bunch of ECUs in a hardware in the loop tests with automated, um, where you can automated, automatically execute tests, you can write uh, a proof of concept exploit that a researcher found down um, in, in a PyTest. So this is literally a, a PyTest function here. Um, and then uh, you give this PyTest function to your hardware in the loop test and it will automatically be executed on 20 or 100 or 1,000 different ECUs uh, in all kind of different states. And then you get uh, Im uh, immediately a feedback um, which ECUs are affected by your expert, for example, or by some, by some exploit that some researchers found. So this is, in our opinion, a, a great thing for automotive security in the future, since time automotive or OEMs need to validate security incidents is at the moment um, pretty high. Um, another fun thing to which I'm using for unit testing quite a lot, uh, this basically simulates an ECU, also only with a few lines of code here um, to, to go through them because uh, I, I like this feature so much. Um, we have an, a can dump here, a log file from with just a bunch of can messages. We extract all the ISOTP messages with an ISOTP message builder here. Um, and then from these messages, we let this ECU utility run over them and extract the internal system state machine and also all the supported responses. So now I'm, I'm having uh, a list of ECU responses which exactly describe um, the uh, communication behavior of that ECU um, during my test. And then I can just create a new socket, in this time a virtual CAN socket, and feed the list of supported responses from this ECU to an ECU answering machine, and that's it. And now I'm cloned the entire communication behavior of my uh, real ECU onto a simulated one on a virtual CAN socket. Okay. Um, all this stuff is available on GitHub. Um, check it out. I'm currently doing a lot of refactoring and improving the documentation. Um, so this scanner code will be there hopefully in the next weeks. Um, but it's already on my personal GitHub. But yeah, you can also write me if you are interested. Um, okay, and some thoughts uh, from my side about automotive security and open source software. Um, so in my opinion, it's great. It has huge benefits for knowledge exchange. Um, it would be good to have OEM independent and open tools, in my opinion. Uh, it would also deliver us a more standardized way for proof of concept exploits. Um, so Metasploit is a good example here, in my opinion. Um, so a portal to Metasploit for the automotive world would be good that you can share a proof of concept exploit with an OEM and you can immediately um, retest this exploit and gives you um, a validation and can analyze which kind of systems are affected. Um, this would speed up the retests um, yeah, a lot in case of incidents. Um, and uh, also open source tools, in my opinion, would allow um, or would lower the entry, the, the gap um, for security research in general since uh, it's pretty hard in the beginning to get um, a foot into the automotive domain since everything is very proprietary. So in my opinion, open source would be a great platform for OEMs to collaborate with each other, even independent from their products, since security is very hard anyway. Uh, and in my opinion, we should all work together to get security done um, and to join forces basically on the security side. But on the other hand, I also see a couple of obstacles for open source software. Um, in general, the automotive industry is highly cost driven. So there is everything need to be calculated and you need, a, uh, you need exact costs for everything. Um, uh, this is also a thing which is very hard for, for open source software. So how do you measure how much an open source software did cost you? Um, also on the other hand, um, the automotive industry is full of secrets and proprietary technology. So as a researcher, we basically have to reverse engineer everything on our own. Um, there's no documentation out there. 
uh, and everything is very, very proprietary. Every OEM does its individual stuff. And another thing, OEMs between each other are very competitive. So they, they have a high competition between each other. So this brings me to a conclusion that open source in general is not free. Uh, it needs to be contributed um, instead of consumed, uh, which can be one thing which could um, slow down the open source movement, since, in my opinion, op um, OEMs have quite a hard time to spend money for something which is not that measurable. So the outcome of an open source project cannot be written down in numbers that easily. Okay, that's from my side. Do you have any questions? Oh, I didn't see any written question. Um, I think it was very, that was really very interesting. Um, can you give us some information how long you have been working on this project? Um, about the scanning project or in, in general? So in general. In, in general, I started with automotive security in 2015 to 16. Um, so my first contact with automotive security was at Tesla when I did an internship there. So I had the pleasure to um, to write some driver for a secure element, uh, and then it started to get my attention. Um, and was in, I was interested in the field. I could do my bachelor thesis and also my master program in that. Uh, and this brought me to automotive security the last five years, basically. Um, and I started with uh, penetration testing of entire vehicles. So we, we looked into um, BMW, Audi, um, a, um, what else did we look at? An Opel and a Mercedes, for example, um, entire vehicles where we did penetration testing, me and my colleague. Um, and we do a lot of let's say low level hardware security stuff. So let's say I'm more um, the car network guy and my um, colleague Enrico, um, he's doing the, the low level disassembling, hacking, hacking um, and side channel stuff. Uh, but together we are basically doing automotive security for the last five years. <laughs>